Hi, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Today is my conversation with Dr. Terry Marks Tarlow. Dr. Marks Tarlow is a psychologist and an educator and an author. She's written on psychology. Um, and I wanted to talk to her about her theory of fractal epistemology. Um, you know, if that sounds heady and confusing, you're not alone. I, I still find it to be such. But the idea of our theory of knowledge reflecting um, a kind of a fractal shape. So fractals being these mathematically derived um, shapes in, in which you can zoom in infinitely and you see um, larger shapes repeated in smaller shapes and you see repeating patterns and that kind of thing. And that actually does make sense to me based on how our minds work, based on how I, you know, my experience obviously uh, uh, of being alive. So um, I wanted to talk to uh, Dr. Marks Tarlow about what this epistemology feels like and kind of start to understand it through that lens um, rather than uh, getting extremely technical, which she's certainly capable of doing. So I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I found it enlightening and, and she's a delightful conversation partner. Um, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Terry Marks Tarlow. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of thing. Thanks very much. Um, well, I'll just say, Terry Marks Tarlow, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's a delight to be here with you. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, and uh, I, what... Uh, made me interested in in you was a random chance and then some um some kind of uh um strange coincidences around things you were saying in in an interview that you did with um oh my goodness now what's his name the time time loops journey biteman and uh eric wargo eric wargo yes and he's someone else that i i uh, am interested in speaking with um and you you have this um, I don't know if you call it a theory or this this basis of um, fractal epistemology, and I know you've talked about it endlessly with people and and written books about it. Um, not yeah, I'd say endlessly, and certainly not enough in the sense that I really hope it can be a paradigm shift for people and uh, the connection that I see with McGilchrist's work is that uh, I can conceptualize it as an epistemology for the right brain. So our Western normal uh, sort of platonic and Aristotle based ancient Greek logic is left brain logic right. and reductionist science. And the fractal epistemology is a right brain system of uh, philosophy that's more akin to the, the mystical uh, philosophies also from ancient time. But yeah. 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 Um, it, it makes so much intuitive sense to me. Um, and to be honest, I've, I've fumbled around um, in the, in thinking about that very thing before I heard about your, your fractal epistemology. I, um, I, I, so it sort of struck me one day that there were, you know, in, in life, there were these larger structures that seemed to mirror these smaller structures and that it really felt like there was a cohesion between the grand and the humble. And I, I don't know exactly how to say it. So the reason, uh, like, I've had to sort of wrestle with why I should have a podcast, you, you know, what, what, what am I going to bring? And, and so I think, uh, my strong desire when I hear about things like this is to kind of get to the bottom of what it feels like and and in what ways it opens the mind and possibilities. Um, I know like uh, people with more expertise could could really dive in with a lot of technical language and things that I'm not capable of. But um, yeah, that's what I kind of want to get to the root of is is something like um, yeah. Like how it feels. So I guess I'm interested in when your first glimmerings of this thought occurred and how it made you feel at the time and kind of where you were at, whether it was a paradigm shift for you or whether it was part of your movement into your current, like who you are now, 
this is not a great way to phrase the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you. I think that's, I think that's an excellent question. And, and I, as a uh, longtime yogini and um, current uh, ballet dancer and rock climber, et cetera, I'm totally into embodiment. So I like that you're focusing on feel in, in the body. And so you are um, inspiring me to tell my my Feynman story, Richard Feynman, the physicist. Um, I know you, the name. Okay, so um, I first discovered fractals in the 1980s, and um, which is pretty close to when they were invented, discovered, depending on how you think about mathematics. And the first thing I did, oh, so okay, back up a little bit. The um, I had the honor of um, being in a weekly drawing group with Richard Feynman and uh, right out of graduate school, really pretty much right out of graduate school, a fluky thing, chance, also synchronicity, just like you're talking about, wow. got into this position. And I, as soon as I realized was dealing with uh, reputedly the world's smartest man, um, I started to read science because, uh, you know, um, what better chance than pick the brain of uh, the world's smartest man, especially someone who was avoiding contact with all the press and he didn't, he wouldn't be interviewed, et cetera. So that elevated mm -hmm. his status quite a bit. And in my, um, that's how I discovered nonlinear science. And that's really when I started to dive into nonlinear science. May I ask what your studies were uh, at the time? Yes, yes. yes. So I um, have a PhD in clinical psychology from UCLA. And I graduated in 1983 and realized that I had done my dissertation in something that didn't interest me at all, which was depression. And I uh, had an early life crisis and, and uh, decided really my greatest area of interest was creativity. And that's what brought me into the sphere of Feynman as I uh, put in a proposal to teach at UCLA Extension. Best way to learn something is to teach it. Uh, they were at the same time doing a huge uh, moderated lecture series on creativity and the moderator got cancer. They asked me to be the moderator. I flipped out because I didn't feel like it was my expertise at all, etc. But I did it and it brought me into contact with a bunch of uh, people that opened doors for me. And one of these doors was um, a sculptor named Tom Van Sant, who was good friends with Feynman, who had the world's smallest image. It was like microns of um, an eyeball. And then the world's largest image on the desert where he set up mirrors of an eye. So it was the same. Mm. And because Feynman obviously, you know, was a scientist and um, Tom uh, combined science and art. They were good friends. I think they met in Mexico flying a kite or something like that. And um, so I uh, I came to these weekly sessions and we would wind up in the hot tub afterwards. And that was when I could really pick his brain. Wow. And which was, of course, another honor, um, not only to be with a world's smartest man but to be naked with the world's smartest man <laughs> yeah kind of a humbling a humbled situation or something like not humbled in the negative sense but just like real humbled yeah yeah and his by the way i mean his exposure to the nuclear bomb he had all kinds of scars on his body from cancer uh, oh. and that ultimately took him out but uh, when i discovered fractals um, the first thing i did was run to him and say, um, don't you think fractals are profound? Because the second I was introduced to them, I had this feeling in my body that they were profound. And, and there were other people around when I said that to him. And uh, someone else said, what's a fractal? And Feynman like took five minutes to what at the time I would say was the state of the art description of fractal geometry. And um, I listened patiently. And when he 
was finished, I turned to him again and I said, don't you think fractals are profound? So guess what he said? What? No. No. No, he didn't say no. <laughs> that would have been a, a letdown. It was a letdown, what he said. He said, I don't understand them. Oh. I th at the time was a complete letdown. And I, you know, sort of slinked away and realized I had to figure out why I thought fractals were profound, which took the next like 30 years to, to do. And I have done it. And I think the epistemology is my answer to why I think fractals are profound. Yeah. In, and at the time, what I didn't realize as, as a psychologist is that his answer was so beautifully paradoxical. You know, here's the smartest man in the world declaring his ignorance after just proving his brilliance by the state of the art definition. And so over time, as I processed all of this, um, I realized that that tension between those polar opposites uh, are why Feynman was so brilliant. And indeed he, he rediscovered um, how to teach physics. He turned it all backwards because I think he started over and did it in the opposite direction that was uh, typical at the time. Um, well, um, it, it's also, it probably says something about uh, him that he, could so freely, you know, admit that he didn't understand them. Like, if he couldn't, yeah. if he grasped about and made up a bullshit answer, you know, it it would have been more disappointing. That would have been more disappointing. Or if he just said no, that would have been the most disappointing. But um, I don't know how much you know about the lore that's that surround surrounded that man. But he he was considered the bad boy of physics. I mean, you you know, when he got the Nobel Prize, he's got this cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Um, he there are books of Feynman stories. Um, so this was my Feynman story in one of my books uh, in Psyche's Veil, uh, which came out in 2007. Um, but there are stories about him uh, telling the people at Los Alamos that he that the, the security was bad. And then uh, when they didn't listen to him, he proved it by breaking in. <laughs> He used to do things like he would go to um, a public party and pretend he was speaking a, a language that was nonsense and get people to pretend they understood him. Oh, wow. He was a bad boy. And That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He would. He was a drummer. Um, he liked oh, cool. to go to Nido places. And, yeah. Could I ask, maybe quickly, uh, we could have uh, your uh, short description of fractals because... I understand them as uh, basically mathematical shapes in which um, there's kind of an, an infinite mirroring um, where the, the more you zoom in or the more you zoom out, the more you see repeated shapes and figures. Um, is that, yeah, you would, you would say it better. No, you said it very well. That's so that self-similarity that you're describing, which is kind of the hallmark principle. Well, um, and uh, scale and variance, which is the similar thing, the same pattern on different um, size or time scales. Um, but the thing about it, it's both a mathematical pattern on the one hand, but it turns out it is how nature does pattern. So it's not, it's one of those places where these sort of uncanny places where although it started out that the precursors to fractal geometry were considered monster curves and pathological of no relevance to the real world. You know, surprise, it turns out it's how the real world works. It's different than human, um, human made constructions, which are um, much more linear and much more reductionist. So, um, what you were describing of a, a fractal zoom is, uh, you know, if you take the length of a table straight in line, it doesn't matter what your what size your ruler is, you're going to come out with the same measurement. But with a in the case of a fractal, the size of your ruler will depend on what you see, mm. and the smaller your ruler, 
the the more information is available, which is the is it's counterintuitive in in the one hand on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's like you know Merlin's magic bag or something where yeah. things come endlessly out out yeah. of it, and there are lots of paradoxical features. So, um, everywhere you look in nature, like once you really understand sort of what a fractal is, and it can be you know any any seed shape. Um, clouds, trees, mountainscapes. My tree right, right here. I was thinking as I was, I was thinking about the branches of the tree as I waited for you to join the call. Exactly, and and that branching pattern is probably in in many ways the most basic, um, where two turns into four, etc., and it just grows exponentially, um, and because that's the same shape that our arteries and veins are that our neurons are it so it's inside our body outside our body um wow yeah and so there are these um so you're de- you were describing self similarity and that has been um really uh captured in things like as above so below so you know spiritual texts texts that say that heaven that the earth is is formed or the universe is formed in the shape of God, um, that kind of thing. That would be a, a, a mm. kind of self similarity on the one hand. But there are other there are all these other really cool things about how fractal geometry works. And in many ways, I want to claim that that math is deeper than science because mm. science uses math to prove its points, but math is the end of the line in terms of you know truth and falsity in a sense um even though there is no there's still no absolute truth with with math but um jung carl jung thought that uh number is the archetype of order order out of chaos and in in many ways going deep into these uh, ways that fractal geometry kind of works at a mathematical level reveals these philosophical principles like um, the the boundary conditions. This is one of the things as a, as a therapist, I'm always paying attention to the boundaries between um, mind and brain, inside, outside, you and me, you know, self, 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 other, self, world, et cetera. I think everything is relational. I think our relationship to our body is relational. And so anytime you've got a relationship, there's going to be a boundary condition. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think of boundaries as these, you know, smooth uh, things where that like inside and outside are are like a cup of water. Not porous, not cloudy. Exactly, exactly. And so that's that dualism inside outside with clear boundaries. But um, in fractals with fractals, it turns out that the boundary is both open and closed simultaneously, depending on how you look, depending on the scale, depending on what's going on with it. Um, So if you got the lungs, for example, the lungs let in certain molecules, but keep out others and lungs are, are a great example of fractal of a fractal shape. And so mm. most uh, all boundaries in nature have this paradoxical quality of right. being open and closed. When are you when are you on the mountain and when are you now in the valley and where was the where was the exact line? You know, there isn't there isn't one. There isn't. And so these this these kind of fuzzy boundaries. Yeah are super interesting and of course there have been uh ancient greek uh, understanding of this and and a similar kind of question was if you take your head of hair and you pluck out one uh hair at a time when are you bald (laughs) (laughs) yeah that so oh sorry i missed the last thing I said the Greeks knew this, you know, that it's a fuzzy line, that that concepts have fuzzy boundaries. And yeah, I knew this too. Um, but and we all know it intuitively, but there's a real humility uh to some of the things that you're saying here about, you know, about mathematics versus science, because um, you know, it, it what 
came to my mind when you said that, and you can correct me if I'm phrasing this wrong, but it seems like almost like science is that table that that we've made and we, we, we've measured and it's and we use mathematics with it, but it's much more comforting to be in the smaller understood sphere. And you can see why we try to describe ourselves based on our products. Um, you know, we try to describe our brains based on computers because we feel that we have a control over a computer. And now with, with AI, there's this notion because you're saying everything's relational. And I believe that we relate to ourselves, you know, every, even our relationship to our, our own mind is relational in some sense, but it takes a, it takes, you have to hit a crisis point to almost say that to, to where you become okay with being on the always on the precipice you know of something huger that you'll never reach the end of whereas there's something very comforting about thinking of our comparing ourselves to these finite things and there's something almost troublingly religious about um thinking that we're like that even in my own mind i'm never in a, a little room i'm never in a place of safety almost does that resonate with you Totally. I think you I think that was very well said. And you could actually translate what you just said to the issue of infinity versus finite, right? finite versus infinite. And I think you're right. And to, to talk about it in terms of certainty and control, that, that the little box gives us the feeling, the illusion of certainty and control over what uh, is fundamentally uncertain and uncontrollable. And um you know, the, the, it's kind of interesting that that some people that look to math for spiritual, you know, to, to kind of spiritual direction, um, associ has have associated God with the infinite and and uh, creation with the finite realm. But the really interesting thing about fractal geometry is it injects infinity into our um existence yeah so uh that's part of i think that initial feeling that i had about profundity with it is this sense of that infinite um expanse that is inside of finite dimensions because that's what fractal dimensionality is so that was the invention that mandelbrot had is a different understanding of dimensionality mm. our typical uh understanding is zero uh, zero is a point and and one dimensional is a line and two dimensional is a plane and three dimensional is a sphere and um and we tend to think of ourselves as living on those dimensions but actually it turns out that if you put infinity between each of them we're living between dimensions just like all the action is between you and i and between mm. you and your body and between you and your mind it's the space those infinite spaces between that really carry um all the action yeah um so yeah uh, that's that's all really great and I, part of your story that I think is so cool, uh, two things that, that came to mind when you were talking was, number one, you had your crisis early. You had your crisis in terms of you were studying the wrong thing. And I am increasingly convinced that these crises are like, I didn't, I, I feel like I had my crisis of, <laughs> just a few years ago. I'm 42 now. Um, and it was around the time this podcast was part of of uh, my accept, you know, uh, unpacking my crisis, and then you, but it was a crisis, and it, and you had right away an intuition towards something that you were, uh, like, you couldn't put into words. You couldn't, you couldn't school Feynman and say, well, let me tell you why they're profound, right? And so I love that. It's like it, it really puts intuition as this incredibly important um, faculty. 
Well, and I don't, I'm not sure how much you sort of looked into the books I've written, et cetera, but, but intuition is my big thing. So yes. Course- uh, yeah. I know, I know you've talked about intuition, so I, I am, I'm, I'm not uh, throwing something new at you here. Like, oh yeah. Like, you, have you ever thought about the importance of intuition? But, uh, but actually, as I was, I, I sort of do a little bit of meditating before, um, my conversations and one of the things that came to my mind have you ever heard the song how can i keep from singing it's a hymn um well it i had never it's about the spirit sorry go ahead yeah sing it oh my goodness uh (laughs) i could sing it but i might just i might just uh recite it i've got guitars here but uh anyway no it's it's actually a beautiful melody as well but um it I've always seen it as describing the spiritual life. And I've just, as I was processing some of the things I know of you, um, it came to my mind as a description of the, in, of the intuition. So the, the, the first verse is, um, my life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentations. I hear the real though far off hymn that hails the new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing it sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? And um, it's um, it's really good. And then the last verse, and this one always like, I might well up with tears, which is not my normal state, but for some reason this verse gets me. It says, um, I lift my eyes, the cloud grows thin. I see the blue above it. And day by day, this pathway smooths since first I learned to love it. The, the peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? And um, it's uh, like, I I always resonate with things that describe, there's the cloud, there's the porous boundary that you were just discussing. And I wasn't going to bring up the hymn, it just came to my mind. But this idea of, I see the blue above the cloud, and it doesn't, get really specific about what's there but it's it's also incredibly stirring to me on on like a very very deep level compared actually in contrast to things which really enumerate uh god's uh you know appearance almost you know what i mean things that that ra- that the ratio or whatever as uh uh um, William Blake would say, like things that are known and and quantified and and properly stored. So this is this is to me uh, a feeling that the that the actual life of 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 submission to this reality that contains these larger um, things things that you can intuit years before you can you know write your your book about it that that is in in a way is freeing and it's humbling but it's freeing and it's it's just too it's just real Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) yeah i kind of petered out there but that 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 was sort of something that um uh the song really came came back to me as you were talking about this and so you you were off on on kind of a quest then to um, to the to the undiscovered country of fractal epistemology, I guess maybe take up the story from there. Well, I'm I'm just going to associate to your verse um, because I think it it captures a feeling that I try to capture on a daily basis of um, using. I mean, I'm not a singer; I'm more a dancer but um, getting into flow through a creative expression and opening and even um, a synesthetic one. And so uh, I, I have the, the privilege of being able to, to take ballet classes with live music. And I, when I'm dancing, um, imagine my body singing the music and so that's very similar, you know, and, and then it becomes a whole body expression and yeah. a unified one, as opposed to when I first started out, move this toe, now move that. And, right. You know, 
jerky and disconnected. There's the there's almost the stereotype of the mat with the footprints <laughs> that are and it's always like a it's it's even like an uncomfortable looking shoe that makes the footprint, you know what I mean, on those with the like lines drawn in between. And that's just exactly the opposite of what right. dance should be, I suppose. Right, right. And so, I mean, I, I just love getting into flow and um, at this stage of my life, try to get into flow with everything that I do when I, I you know, when I see patients for therapy, um, that those are my best sessions that feel like a flow. And, um, and then when I'm writing, I used to, when I wrote, I, I'm on my, I think my uh, 14th book or my 15th book. And when I first started, um, I, it took me 15 years to do my first book. And I just was like, uh, grunt, uh, labor, labor, uh, uh. <laughs> well, I, you know, couldn't find my voice Threw threw away the manuscript three times. Um, and, uh, but now I only want to sit down when I feel inspired because I'm convinced that what I'm feeling as I write is what people experience when they read it. Mm. And if I'm struggling, they're going to feel it. They're going to feel it. They're going to feel it. And in fact, that first book, Psyche's Veil, um, I think when it came out and these ideas were so unfamiliar, because um, that was my first attempt at really bringing non, the nonlinear world, including fractal geometry into the clinical sphere, um, I think it felt to people like climbing a mountain to read. Uh, it was very dense and this sort of thing. And actually, now that I reread it, it's not so bad, but it's only because I'm more, um, you know, I'm more familiar with my own ideas. Right. You're steeped in it. Um, may I ask this um, flow, this appreciation of flow, did that precede all of the sort of more academic stuff? Or did you, like when young young Terry Marks Tarlow, were you an embodied person or were you someone who had to come to appreciate embodiment? Great question. I, you know, I, I think I've always had a highly embodied side, but they were very, it was very separate from my professional life. So I um, was a rock climber. I was an avid rock climber. Uh, when I was younger, I was a near extreme skier. Um, I, I really came to ballet primarily after having children and not being able to climb anymore because it sort of felt like, you know, I'm on my toes a little bit like rock climbing is a little bit like ballet on the rocks because um, you're, yeah. you're on your toes a lot and, and just the ability to shift your, shift your weight and, and all of that stuff. Um, and then yoga, I started when I was uh, in college. So I've been, you know, doing that more than 40 years. And so I had this life of my body and then this life of my mind, and they were very separate. And in even in my as a therapist, I didn't think of, I didn't think they went together. I mean, I never would share anything about those activities, etc. It's only in the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years. Um, that I realize, especially as embodiment gets more and more central in psychology, and indeed the unconscious is in the body. It's not in the head, it's in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gut sometimes. Well, the gut. And other places. And other places all around. Um, as somatics have gotten increasingly uh, central focus, as I have uh, studied interpersonal neurobiology, um, and the importance of the body there too, um, and developmental neurobiology, which I teach, uh, I, I have more and more brought together these sides of myself. And, um, and so um, I'd say maybe for the last 15 years, the, it's, it's all blended in a sense. And yeah. I, I readily talk about yoga and breath work and uh, the moving meditation of yoga, which I think in some ways is more valuable than closed eyes types of meditation and still meditation for, sure. for real life um, yeah. for a couple of different reasons, both because it you can get into flows, 
but also um, just the drishti of being eyes half open, half closed. You're both looking out and in at the same time, which is a really useful, it's a really useful function to yeah. be able to do both at once. And there's a distracting uh, structure to it that maybe helps not overthink or something like that. Oh, that too. Well, the best for that is rock climbing. You cannot think when you're right. You cannot think. And I was very, very aware of that. I mean, I, I always used my activities to sort of wipe the slate clean. Yeah. And, and just wipe away stress and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, when you're doing yoga, uh, mindfully i know some people don't they think the whole time they're doing it and they think about all their problems and stuff but if you if you do it um uh, the way it was intended with the breath as the center of the focus uh and really uh using mindfulness um then it too wipes everything else away and uh, i think that ability to wipe everything else away is something that people are losing track of with their distractibility and short attention spans and this sort of thing. And so it really helps lengthen um, attention, attention span in a sort of a fuzzy, a fuzzy place, a fuzzy undefined place that we are talking about yeah. as opposed to that very specific tuning in type of. I, uh, my experience of this, because I'm, I'm the opposite. I, I really, I don't know what I was like as a small child, but I feel that I became quite unembodied um, at a certain point in my, well, not at a certain point, <laughs> uh, over time in my life. Um, and uh, I, I'm a musician and I've actually done quite a bit of, um, of leading music at church. And so I was raised in the Baptist church and um, when I, 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 when I became a good enough musician to do that, I did it and I always felt strange about it. And then as I was, um, having a crisis of faith, I'm sorry to give so much of my own biography here, but, um, as I was having a crisis of faith, I was actually finally employed at a church. And one of my main duties was leading the music. And it was really strange to me because I was still having very like my my most spiritual experiences the times that i felt oh maybe i am a christian were always when i was on the stage um in front of the congregation hearing their voices and playing guitar and actually playing as a fairly complicated finger picking guitar because i was kind of trying to challenge myself to at least improve my guitar skills if i was going to be conflicted about the about my faith i may as well improve my guitar skills at the same time so i was you know basically doing this thing that amounts to kind of tap dancing and spinning plates you know because it took a lot of concentration and a lot of embodied like muscle memory and that kind of thing and it wasn't even until kind of recently that i, I started to think that uh this was is a kind of a meditation it was it, i couldn't i couldn't think about anything else while I did that. And um, it kind of, it kind of makes me appreciate, like, actually, when I stand in a congregation, and I still have this, less so less so now that I've kind of started to work through these concepts, but um, it's hard, it's actually hard for me to, to lose myself in, uh, I, I'm going to say worship, but uh, in the singing and, and, and in the theology of the lyrics and that kind of thing, if I'm not playing, and when I am playing it, it comes to it, it comes more naturally like i i will find that the the sentiment of the song will kind of glow and really i can just feel it coming coming out of me in a, in a way that seems real so um that actually um i i think has been a meditative thing and it leads to another thought that i had that i wanted to mention um as i was trying to think of possible uh experiences of fractal uh fractals um let's see if i can describe this and then you can tell me if it's if it's fractal in nature or not um one of the one of the things that that i that occurred to me as i was um in this period of of turmoil i was listening to, to lots of podcasts and i would find that uh, if there was a good podcast where the conversation between two people was flowing very freely and actually it happens surprisingly uh, often on joe rogan's podcast and he's like he's a very controversial guy and 
I'm not, I'm not jumping in on that. He's a master conversationalist though, because he's the master of the interruption of the, of the calculated interruption. And anyway, that kind of thing. So I would listen to Joe Rogan. This was years and years ago now. Um, and, uh, I would realize I wasn't listening to the words anymore. Um, I had stopped paying attention, but I did not turn it off. And then I would be like, well, I should probably turn this off. As soon as my conscious brain r realized that I wasn't listening to the content of what they were saying, I thought, well, I should probably turn it off, but I, I kind of didn't want to at the same time. So I'd kind of let it play. And it, it occurred to me that there was, there seemed to be information in the cadences of um, agreement. And in that, like um, I've heard you mention uh, in other interviews, um, sort of like that that other entity between you and your conversation partner or you and, and maybe your psychotherapy client or whatever, if there's not something more being created, um, you know, in the connection between you, then and it's not a maybe a good session or something like that. So it um, and then that got me thinking that that even um, melodies in music contain some kind of information. Mm -hmm. Um, that is actually separate from the lyrics and some of the, some things with fairly stupid lyrics will, you know, will be more moving than something with technically a, a great lyric. Is this something that ties into the fractal epistemology or am I just really going into intuitive territory? Yeah, no, no, no. It, music, uh, music is pink noise and um, lots of it is fractal. So especially Bach. Uh, you can really hear the voices and that those are self-similar themes. There uh, was a guy named, I think, Hugh, H-U, um, who developed a, a machine to take the fractal seed shape of different composers and make new music um, oh. on those. Um, and so... Uh, in, in the sense that there's a, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a theme that gets repeated and gets elaborated on or changed or what have you. It's definitely, um, that is definitely fractal though. When you were talking about, um, and languages too, in the sense that, um, any language, you can take a phrase and then embed other phrases infinitely inside of it. And so the structure of language, the openness, the fact that we have a limited number of words, but an unlimited expression um, is partly due to, to that embedded um, nature of, of language. Um, so that that is that too is, is uh, fractal. But um, the other thing, though, that you were talking about initially of the listening to the conversation without um, and, and just listening to the cadence of it, um, that's really uh, a, a difference between the explicit and the implicit. So the explicit would be the content, it would be the words, it would be, you know, um, sort of analyzing the meaning. But the implicit is are things like the cadence and the emotion that is and the, the gender you get all we get all kinds of information about about the person um, through the implicit part, which is the right brain part of of language and of course preverbal. So when parents, when you're talking to your uh, little kids um, and they before the age of two and they don't understand it, they're only hearing. Uh, your emotion, your cadence, all of that stuff. And it does set them up to, um, uh, for the particular language. And, but it also, it's, that is the basis of attachment. So uh, attachment dynamics happen uh, before, before uh, they, they get set in, in place, before children can even understand language. So by two, your attachment style is already in place because of exactly what you were talking about the, the whole message and and some people say that 80 percent of communication is nonverbal and implicit i've heard that yeah so all of the non all of the non uh, explicit parts or the implicit parts are elaborating the elaborating and and adding to and even transcending the words that are being said um mm -hmm. weighing a lot of information so do you have a um do you have a time or a, a story that um where your fractal epistemology um 
was a felt sense, like where you kind of recognized it as a felt sense or something that really had a positive impact on your life. Like, like I said at the beginning, I'm I'm fascinated by what the what the feeling of of fractal epistemology uh, is when when you really have internalized it in a way that like you know I'm trying to think of it still in the intellectual sphere, but you've lived with it. So did you have like a breakthrough moment where you thought like this is this is something real and it's it's in me now and well you know that that first felt sense of and and my question to to Feynman of don't you think fractals are profound so i i think i've gone from sensing that they're profound to more and more the ability um to fully embody it from in multiple ways and multi, from multiple perspectives. Like for me, I approach, um, I mean, I was raised Jewish, but I never really bought into it at all. Separation of, of God from creation just never made sense to me. Um, I've always been attracted to uh, more um, mystical, uh, view of of interconnection between things and um so uh, you know an image like indra's net uh which is a beautiful image of indra the the god and in, indian god in the sky uh casting his net where each inter in the interstices in that I'm not sure how do you say the word but you know where the place where yep. the net together has a pearl each one has a pearl and every pearl reflects every other pearl well that's a fractal that's a fractal image and um and and a deep one and uh that uh, um ability to actually experience the universe in that fully interconnected way that also allows for separation where it's not just one or the other but we're all we all have that we're all absolutely indispensably interconnected with the universe as a whole because of those open boundaries on the one hand but on the other hand there is a functional separation that, that emerges in various spots and so i now feel those intellectual concepts more than think them mm. you know i so i um yeah, so it is. It, it has gotten deeper and deeper in my body, and I've always approached spirituality through science, not through faith. Uh, you know, like faith-based things, always through science um, for me. And um, so, that's kind of cool. I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's it, there are so many different ways to experience uh, the mystical, and yeah, it's something that I that I'm I'm fascinated. I was shocked to find, after uh, feeling I had left a religious context, to find that I had a desire for spiritual experience or something like that. But I, I guess what you know that this, I mean, what you're describing just kind of feels. Um, inherently spiritual which is probably it probably gets viewed sidelong by uh some of your contemporaries but it, you know because it's they would see it as not scientific but you're experiencing it through science um yeah i don't know it's it's funny i um it's never been my fate that anyone has sort of taken me on and said you're wrong hmm. um what is more my fate, which may have to do with being a woman, I'm not sure, is people just not being interested mm. because these are unfamiliar ideas and not everyone wants to bask themselves in it. But it feels to me that the times are changing in that way. Like there's been a whole lot more interest. I have a whole lot more people like you. You know, you said, oh, maybe you don't want to do this podcast because you're in inundated uh, with requests. Well, it's not true that I'm inundated with requests, but I have been getting more more and more because I do think that there's something about this era yeah. that is opening people up to 
uh, you know, up, up to uh, these kinds of ideas. So, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, astrology and things like that have uh, kind of exploded, and um, even uh, well, th this is something I don't, I don't want to. I, I don't mean this to impugn, but I've noticed certain very involved conspiracy theories uh, in in recent years have also kind of exploded things like the flat earth theory. Uh, and um, and and my what what I hold in my, uh, is that uh, um, maybe some of these things are um, are people just intuitive, like people who have felt like maybe their intuition has been silenced and uh you know or their intuition has been devalued and and maybe like intuition itself is not not prized and all of a sudden they have this uh this new theory whether it be uh you know some kind of alternative spirituality or some kind of conspiracy theory where their intuition is allowed to run rampant uh and maybe they're not uh you know and and they've they've overcompensated they've gone too far they've 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 not you know they've not maybe brought it into balance with other faculties and and the you know the science of the day and that kind of thing but um yeah i i think there is a growing interest that's kind of coming out in healthy and unhealthy ways um is that something that resonates with you like do you feel like maybe the intuition um at least in the recent past has been kind of devalued and and uh, underappreciated oh yeah absolutely i i'm i'm gonna put my hand in front of my camera because i see i'm fuzzy so let oh, me just yeah. and get it um there yeah, we go you, you look crisp now <laughs> um i you know i i have a, a slightly different interpretation for why in this in people's intuition is more in the forefront. I think it's because um, there's such clear uncertainty in society and such clear disconnection between one generation and the next in terms of knowledge uh, transfer that um, you know, the elders are not equipped in the same way as thousands of years ago to pass on information because it's changing too rapidly and because there's too much of it. Um, and especially because there's too much of it and anyone and everyone it has been democratized can have uh, spades of it. And so unless we draw upon intuition to know what's important and what's not important, we're going to drown. People are going to drown. Yeah. And so as a faculty, um, and certainly as a clinician, but as a faculty, I think it's our most important faculty. And unfortunately, society is going in the opposite direction in some ways by our child care uh, practices where we overstructure um, and over monitor our children. And that does not allow them to develop intuition they need free play and free exploration and to, to some degree unsupervised time uh, so they can internalize all of this stuff themselves and kind of take information from the inside out instead of from the outside in um, but it's going the other way the whole failure to launch thing and um, uh, you know every kid just everybody being more and more stressed out and, and this sort of thing. Um, but I definitely agree with you that that intuition is, uh, um, you know, people, people are recognizing the need for it and, um, and that there's that there's both good news and bad news. And, and it can never be, you know, when it's ungrounded or untethered, then it's, then you get wild theories and crazy stuff. I, I'm, I happen to be listening to a whole a podcast on conspiracy theories um, in Spanish because I'm trying to get fluent in Spanish. Oh. And um, I was thinking about that before when you were talking about listening to the podcast, but not to the words, because I don't always understand uh, what I'm listening to, but I do understand it's valuable anyway, because that there's something about exposing myself and immersing myself that's really helping but so yeah. that flat world thing i mean i've been hearing a whole lot of conspiracy things that are just like whoa who who could even 
entertain any of this stuff, but uh, it's fun to listen in Spanish, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I should be careful because I, I really got into it. Like, I think right at the, I never was a flat earth. Uh, I never believed in the flat earth, but uh, uh, early on in, in kind of w what I'm considering my spiritual transformation, I became kind of obsessed with, with it. And uh, I think it was because I was processing like the nature of, you know, belief and, and all of that kind of thing. And one of my first guests, the reason I started the podcast, because I was thinking of starting a podcast and I reached out to one of the, one of the most famous flat earthers, um, uh, Mark Sargent, who had done, uh, there was a documentary called Behind the Curve, or uh, I think that's the name of it, uh, on Netflix about him. And he said yes to the interview. So one of my first talks was to a flat earther. And I was, we were talking about the nature of belief. And and and, and uh, it, yeah, I, I don't really have a question there. But I do think there's something, I think the phenomena needs to be, uh, needs to be take the phenomena and the people need to be taken a little more seriously maybe because i do think that they are suffering from um a natural like whatever is causing it to kind of explode right now it has to be something that is of of interest to us and not just not just to say that people are stupid because that's yeah. that just can't be the case well, so what do you think that's about i mean i i can't imagine anyone believing that uh when there's so much proof to you yeah. know like pictures of the whole earth uh, yeah i mean so on on the yeah oh, okay uh, yeah no so this is a rabbit hole and i'm going to be very careful and try to be succinct but uh i think that it it is about um some people have a kind of a profound but not very um well explored sense that they have uh, not been allowed to trust their their own senses um, that the world and probably because of how much information there is and um, and how overwhelming it is and then also how science has um, gone back and forth on certain things what gives you cancer and what doesn't and all of these things that at, at a certain point um, they have such a strong desire to take uh, to take their intellect in their hands and there's actually this this um, sense of of strength in stepping outside of the accepted. Like it's a, I mean, it's a gnostic, uh, a gnostic thing, perhaps. Um, I, I don't know. Like, and I'm not an expert enough in in gnosticism, but uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where um, they 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 feel a desire to transcend the the narratives and there's all kinds of other things you know there's personality traits that in um make them more prone to want to be the bearer of bad news some of them you know uh and uh, i hate to break it to you kind of thing i don't know there's a lot of things i could i could talk about it forever but i do think it has i do think it's deeply tied to intuition um in, in a way because they've um like even my my daughter because i've talked to she's seven and i talked to my kids about the things i'm interested in and um and i've never promoted the flat earth theory to them but we've talked about it and uh she said the earth does look flat you know like it always looks flat to me and i mean like, yeah you're you're right there's a certain amount of faith in um what other people are saying that is necessary to realize that we're on a big ball because you you wouldn't assume it uh you know and it's yeah anyway um yeah okay <laughs> It's scary to me, but it makes sense. It is. It is scary. Um, yeah, and I, I don't really know how you counteract it. I have a strange love for these people, um, but uh, I also uh, I feel like yeah, we, we have something needs to be done to make the numbers start going down instead of up. But it's a fundamentalism as well, um, and fund. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I think that the way that social media works promotes these uh, these subgroups of people that hold these theories because they just you you know you 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 get presented with videos that are in line with your beliefs and you just go deeper and deeper down rabbit holes um, yeah. instead of going broader and broader and so. To me, on the one hand, I, you know, I absolutely cherish intuition. I know, uh, you know, Ian McGilchrist also uh, does and Einstein. I mean, everyone, uh, you know, 
um, uh, talks about its value at the core of, of insight and, and understanding on the one hand, but it's got to be grounded by other, other things. It just, you know, just to go down the rabbit hole of a single perception without uh, opening up to multiple perspectives and multiple ways of, of viewing that thing, I think is, is very, very dangerous. Um, so, you know, if we could send people in space and they would see, they would see the earth as a ball and then their uh, intuition would be in line with their, uh, the, you know, their direct experience would be in yeah. line with, their, um, you know, with the, the, the limited perspective of being only on one place on the earth. And in fact, when the astronauts first went into space, and saw the earth as a whole, it was a mystical experience for them. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, I was just reading a book about this. Keep going. Right. And uh, it turns out Tom Van Sant, the man I was talking about, who had the world's largest image and the world's smallest image and hosted those drawing classes for Feynman and others, um, was the first one to put together that first image of the world as a whole. That right. it had been seen before uh photographically so oh interesting yeah so yeah i you know i think intuition is informed by experience and what you want to call direct experience versus you know just the perception of of you know i look out my window and what do i see um kind of thing but when i look at photographs of, of space and you know things like that that becomes part of into of, of the stuff that feeds intuition as far as i'm concerned unless you limit yourself from these things but i know these conspiracy perspectives often are that those are those are manipulated we never went into space right. all that crap it's like yeah just... well and honestly it does give the left brain a lot of stuff to chew on because uh, you know, I, I even found myself making, uh, making up stories about, okay, well, what, what, you know, maybe when did we discover the earth was flat? If it would, you know, if the earth was really flat, when would we have discovered this? And I made this entire narrative in my head about what happened. And so it does give you a lot, you know, th there is something rich there in terms of considering things, but it, obviously I, I find it, uh, wrong, but, uh, I guess, um, something that came to mind that that's come to mind a couple of times in this conversation, uh, is when you have this um, intuitive fractal um, epistemology regarding reality itself, like, does that sort of, how would I put it? Is there a way or have you, have you met anyone who really was attracted to the fractal um, epistemology, but who wasn't mystic like who, who wasn't mystical at all like does it kind of go hand in hand with a bit of a mystical view and has it has it made has it changed your view of god whether like god is real or just a concept or whatever like has it changed like did it sort of demand that you consider certain things that you hadn't considered before in the spiritual realm yeah i think it it in for me, it informs the spiritual realm. I mean, I think that's an interesting question about whether anyone embraces the epistemology who doesn't sense it's it as a spiritual thing. I mean, I think there are many physiologists, for example, that are uh, you know working with fractals in in physiology and medicine um, who probably don't think about these things. But but then again, they're not embracing the epistemology they're simply working with fractals and there's a difference right one is a one is an attempt to understand the nature of understanding based on uh how these principles work and the other is a more uh you know working working with the world and and its things and using using uh fractals to model these things and so uh, that's a, a different um focus but for me it has deepened my ability to articulate this, uh, a mystical felt sense. And so my most recent thing, which I guess I'll tell you, I haven't really said this before on a podcast or publicly really at all, 
um, where my next book, the, the book that I'm just launching. And so I just finished uh, my first graphic novel. I saw um, that. Yeah, yeah, which I, which is really fun to do. And I did all the illustrations and that was great. Um, and it was about sexual trauma and uh, called The Eel and the Blowfish. I'm just giving a little plug right now because I think it's a really good, um, it's a good vehicle for addressing sexual trauma and any kind of trauma um, for multiple reasons. But anyway, um, the next, the next uh, book that I am de delving into with the same person that I worked on this one with, Leanne Domash, is um, surrounds the notion of interpenetration. And the notion of interpenetration is absolutely fractal. And it's quite different. I haven't heard anybody talk about it before. Um, and it's the idea most simply that uh, we're in the universe fully and the very same time the universe is fully inside of us. So that is a complete interpenetration. And I would, you know, going back to spirituality, that's my thought about God, that um, God is fully inside of me at the same time that I am fully inside of him, her. <laughs> yeah. God. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, God. Um, and uh, uh, so um, I love I love this notion of interpenetration because it's very different than interaction, um, you right. know, and excuse me um less binary less binary and in terms of relationships it's really useful because i think the deeper the relationship the deeper the interpenetration mm. and you know as you and i are talking if we're really resonating with one another and our bodies are in sync and we and uh it turns out that physiological synchrony is um at the basis of uh, a felt sense of connection um and of intimacy and of the therapeutic relationship as well um i think that the um all of that the deeper the synchrony the deeper the interpenetration the deeper you're in me and i'm in mm. you and same time yeah i can even you know i can i can feel that i i feel like when i'm listening and that's one of the things i've tried to learn to do is really listen through this podcast and i know that i'm putting myself into you you know when when you say things if you say something that um resonates with me then i've put a little piece of myself into you and i'm seeing you know this sounds like silly but i'm seeing myself talking back but then i can ask a question which you know i i'm not as i'm not now making you me it, it's different yeah no i can oh, yeah. that has instant intuitive uh yeah. <laughs> reality to me i'm glad you i'm glad that there that it makes sense to you and that that you resonate with that idea because i i do um i i do think it's super useful for looking at different levels of, of, um, you know, this, our relational presence, you know, our relationship to our bodies, to our minds, to other people, to the universe at large, et cetera. And, and in the sense that I, I think of spirituality in a very sort of, um, uh, profane way of just everybody's, uh, sense of the connection to the whole or to the large, to the, to the big picture. Yeah. So everybody has a feeling about that. Yeah. Atheism, and which is fine, but yeah. Uh, so there's an inherent. I think there's an inherent or implicit spirituality just in um, meditating to the in in relationship to the big picture. I love that, um, and I, I, I it's in, it's an interesting use of the word profane because it's. <laughs> It feels so. It feels sacred to me, not not profane. Yeah, uh, and that polarity is one of the of those things, right? Where the where the more we can feel the sacred in the profane, yeah, more we embody our spirituality. And and it's it's fascinating too because I mean I think I don't think it's controversial to say that it, our sexuality in the Western world is. Uh, uh, well, I mean, in my opinion, has been profaned in the sense that uh, the 
spiritual side and the connection side to some degree has been, uh, well, has been removed, but also uh, for some, the spiritual side has been, is the only thing uh, that is there. And there is no spirituality in the movement of bodies. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, it's sort of the nexus of, of how we're really? fucked up, uh, <laughs> like um, in a way. Yeah, uh, that's an example of, of really polarized uh, things like tantric, uh, tantric yoga, you know, right. uh, is all yeah. about the, the, uh, the spiritual side of, of sexuality and on the one hand, and, and yet um, it's true, it's really been polarized uh, to, to a huge degree. And it's a good example of um, and sort of take this interpenetration. Actually, uh, a big way I came to um, focus on that term and that concept was uh, I was invited to write an essay on gender fluidity hmm. for uh, a journal called Psychoanalytic Inquiry. And, um, and so I, I accepted and in, instead of doing it as an academic thing, because it's not an area that's really, I've been academically uh, done a lot of research in. I did it in terms of um, my own sense of gender fluidity. So I started out with uh, just my personal reflections uh, through my lifespan. And then I uh, brought in the fractal epistemology and things, but, but um, because uh, right from an early age, I've been very male identified I told you I was a rock climber, et cetera. And, uh, um, and I, I sort of didn't want to be, have, um, some of the lack of freedoms that women had, you know, right from the start. And, and so I, I kind of attached myself to more of a male, male identity um, and, and then flipped, flipped that and more identified with my father. And then um, later in life, I, I flipped it. When I started ballet, I got interested in the, in the concept of grace and grace both what grace means in a, a sort of concrete way with the body, but grace also bringing the spiritual sense of grace into dance. Um, and I then tried to feminize, but I now view gender in this interpenetrating way. And in fact, believe that uh, everybody's two sides of the brain um, are gendered, that, that the right brain is uh, female and the left brain is male. Yeah. And um, although, um, Ian McGilchrist doesn't really go there directly. He certainly does in the description of the two. And I have gone there directly um, in, in mythology. I mean, I, I, my book before uh, the graphic novel was, um, was called Mythic Imagination Today, mm -hmm. the interpenetration of mythology and science. And I look, and I love that book, actually. It's a tiny little book. It was an invited monograph. And it looks at the origins of mythology, the origins of science, and this sort of thing. And yeah. um, as far back as Psyche's Veil, that first uh, book on the nonlinear, I look at the myth of Psyche and Eros in terms of Psyche representing the right brain and Eros representing uh, the left brain. And... Um, we analyze the myth as the marriage between the hemispheres, essentially, in that myth. Much like I have discovered, uh, uh, McGill Chris starts with a myth uh, also, um, but it's a different one in the chapter I'm reading now um, on uh, on the union of opposites. So it was interesting that uh, he, he sort of um, is drawn to this ancient wisdom that, you know, mirrors contemporary ideas. Um, and uh, I too, for many, many years have looked at creation myths and how they mirror, uh, um, you know, facets of, of the psyche internally and uh, society, et cetera. Um, but uh, I think that the interpenetration of the genders inside of each one of us is profound and um, very much like the uh, I Ching, uh, the perspective of the I Ching in the world of there's a masculine and a feminine, um, you know, in everywhere is how they. 
Yeah. I, I, one of the, one of my great sadnesses about the, um, I guess the public discussion around gender these days is that, I mean, it's just, it's always seemed, no, not always, that gives myself way too much credit. But since we started, you know, since we started being aware uh, publicly that there were so many people who didn't um, identify with um, the gender that they were assigned or told that they were, it just seems inherently spiritual to me immediately. It's like we, you know, these are people who have, uh, based on, on, on since you know maybe life experience and and internal uh senses that they may not have chosen they've been forced to grapple with it in mm -hmm. essence the spiritual uh side of their gender uh you know the the fact that it is not uh entirely uh it's not entirely dictated by genitalia and that there's there's this other spiritual side and that i i just think that we're missing out on some really great insights from from both sides because um you know i mean i i i'm sure that many uh transgendered people and many people who are non non-binary or gender fluid um do have spiritual practice or or do have um, the ability to bring some spiritual language but i but you know i think that would be such a powerful tool in their hands um you know to and they they could be seen as 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 oracles you know as someone to contribute strongly to the conversation that has needed to be had about gender you know for maybe forever or at least in in western history right well what you're describing is actually how many transgendered people are embraced in an indigenous cultures they are often seen as a spiritual leader and embraced in their ability to see realms that are uh invisible to to other people and um you know it's a lovely way to uh i think a lovely way to to view it i um I, I view it a little more physiologically, um, but I think what you're saying is interesting. I'm not trying to pin it. I'm not trying to pin it down in any way. I'm just yeah. right. No, it's I, I have I have never sort of thought about that. That it does allow for a spiritual um, inroads, if you will. Um, though, but the way I've understood it from uh, you know from a physiological point of view is. Um, guy named Jak ja Panksepp, who was one of my uh, intellectual heroes. And, and also I had the privilege of co-authoring a paper pretty close to before he died. He um, was the founder of affective neuroscience. So the study of emotion in, um, and mostly rats, he was, he's known as the rat tickler um, on the internet because he yeah. had rats laugh um, or his graduate student discovered it anyway, he gets credit, but um, uh, he described to me um, a, a num number of years ago that there are two circuits for um, uh, gender in the brain. One of them is body allocation, and the other is the um, mental circuit, the emotional circuit. And sometimes those circuits separate. Um, so one goes one direction and the other goes the other direction and um, tends to be connected to trauma in the womb. And I believe that he might have identi identified exactly when that trauma happens. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, that's the way I've always thought of it. But I kind of like what you're saying, that that, that it, be, it does become an opportunity that 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 ethereal level of the emotional or the mental side of it, um, when and when it's separated, I think when whenever anything is separated and there's friction, um, this is what I'm reading. The chapter I'm reading in McGillicarist, right, is how friction is the cause of polarities. Of, that the polarities are what bring something new into being, and yeah. so that's an interesting friction you're just you're describing. Or even that idea of opponent processing. Uh, where if I want to make a very fine movement, um, resisting resisting my own movement actually increases that. I don't know if that kind of applies, but um, you're nodding, so. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, well, in dance too, but yeah, are we like 
getting out of time. Oh, well, yeah, you know, I, 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 I more accurately, I think uh, we're getting to the point where there's been, uh, I feel that that you have uh, expressed how it how this epistemology feels and that someone like myself who is very far from um you know an actual scientific uh, understanding or an academic you know uh, understanding of these things can kind of can kind of get a sense maybe of of what you felt in the hot tub which with richard Feynman. <laughs> maybe that'll be the name of the episode in the hot tub with richard Feynman. um catcher. But, i catch yeah. her i think that's the one <laughs> um yeah, that Feynman story is in Psyche's Veil, and I used to not tell it because I wanted people to read the book, and then I realized, no, you know what? It's a good story, yeah, and it's, it's a good a, Feynman story. It's a yeah. very good story. So that that yeah, you've provided some of that for for people, and and I have this like, I have this burning desire to 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 get these things, um, to get people interested in things like this, because it's so interesting to see where they where they go with it. I mean, you went in such a different uh direction and and uh you know Feynman had his uh it, you know things that he was naturally moving towards and you move towards something else and someone studying fractals in physiology moves in a different way and so I mean yeah the, I think fractally <laughs> these ideas can spiral out as long as that that initial spark is lit and that initial um intuition and fascination so I think we, we're kind of there and I don't want to beat it over the head to the point that people tune out. So um, I guess that's kind of where I am. I could talk all day. <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, keep it within a, a human time frame here. Absolutely, and I think that's the sign of a, you know, of a really interesting process. Um, but I agree with you. We don't want to make it too long, and it's been a pleasure to to talk to you. You, you know, we've touched on a whole lot of different things. Yeah, no, I've I've really enjoyed this. So thanks so much for um for being on on morning talk show, and I'll I'll send you a link when it's uh when it's all ready to go. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right, so I'll I'll cut it there. And uh, but uh, man, yeah, this was just I mean, this was just exactly what I was hoping it would be. I I really appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, as I say to uh, all my guests, I, I, it would be great to talk again someday if 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 the stars align. I'm going to read some of your work now. I I jumped on it as soon as I kind of had that intuitive sense of connection with you, and uh, and I downloaded uh, something onto my Kindle app, but I haven't read it yet, and so I'm really excited to read. So, what was the one you said that was quite short? Um, mythic imagination today. Yeah, okay. I think that one you would like that one. Okay, written. It's part of a series in, um, hi. This is Aubrey. Hi. This hi. is Terry. Hi, Terry. Oh, you can't hear her though. Oh. Sorry, because I, she's in my yeah, headphones. Yeah, I, I can hear her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's, writ, it's, it's part of this popular series, series on popular culture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hi. And, and Delia. <laughs> this is Terry. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'll, I'll read that one because it sounded like really interesting. And it was nice to know that it's because like, I, I might not be ready to read Psyche's Veil uh, yet. I could I could give it a go. Um, I, I will I will try it. But uh, um, uh, as I said, I'm, the, the written word, I wish there was an audio book of it because uh, I have some kind of, that's another thing I would love to talk to you about about with someone is I have a real bias towards auditory you know the fractal thing is so visual it's so visual like i it's really hard to talk about this stuff without showing it as a picture yeah and so you know i now i illustrate all my books i insist everything has to be illustrated that's and, so cool um so i think maybe that'll help um, yeah look at but that's fair the the mythic imagination has a lot of the elements of the epistemology in it. Uh, Psyche's veil was the precursor, so it also has a lot of the elements. The actual epistemology is quite technical, and it's a it's an edited book that's got like mathematicians and physicists and psychiatrists, and um, there's a chapter on psychedelics and and fractals and this oh, sort wow. of. I, you probably want to stay away from that. Okay. <laughs> Although um, my two chapters are very readable and the, and the essence of the epistemology is that first chapter, which you can download um, 
it's also in the Journal of uh, Transpersonal Studies. Okay. Uh, so there was, that's how the, the book came out of a special issue on in the journal, International Journal of Transpersonal Studies. Actually, my website, um, I think it should have that paper. It has all oh, okay. my, so you can download the papers, but otherwise you can get it on, you can get that just for free online. Um, and that that's really the heart of it. And um, you, Great. I, you know, you can definitely try that. And, but the book also has a chapter on uh, dream synchrony and synchronicity, um, which you probably would like since it was synchronicity that uh, yeah. brought us together. We didn't even get into that. I thought we might, but I don't like to, I don't like to stop the the flow of things to move in a different direction. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. I, I'm, I'm excited to read it all. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk again, if you want to, if you want to talk more about those things like transpersonal things or, or synchronicity or, you know, dreams or whatever. So yeah. um, oh, all of it, I want to talk about all of it. Maybe I'll just start a, a podcast just with you and what, no, what, no, anyway, no. Um, but uh <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to meet you and I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. I really enjoyed our conversation and you did a great job of just moving us along and um you know widening it out and uh I will definitely put the link on my website and look forward to any other time you want to talk. Oh, that makes me feel great. All right. I'll talk okay. to you soon. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.